I'm Betty Johnson, Assistant Dean for Faculty and Staff Diversity, Development and Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where we are committed to solving serious health and social problems facing the world. Our success in addressing these issues has huge implications for the future. No factor is more important to this pursuit than outstanding leaders. Therefore, the goal of Voices in Leadership is to highlight the experiences of those confronting these major challenges and to better understand what effective leadership is and how it can affect change. We believe these lessons and insights should be shared widely and thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon and welcome to Voices in Leadership. I'm Eric Anderson, the Deputy Director of the program, and I have the privilege of introducing our distinguished guest today. Ash Carter is one of the most accomplished leaders this program has hosted. Secretary Carter studied medieval history at Yale and earned a doctorate in theoretical physics at Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. At Oxford, he spent time on charmed quarks and the higgs boson particle, but he also developed a fascination with defense policy. The career in physics took a backseat to his other passion, but his belief in the power of evidence and research continued to guide him. Mr. Carter served as 25th Defense Secretary from 2015 to 2017, leading the largest organization in the world with more than three million civilian and military employees and an annual budget of more than a half a trillion dollars. Carter became known for his savvy leadership and for ensuring the Pentagon thought outside its five-sided box. Harvard's own Graham Allison said about Secretary Carter, he's the poster child for the guy who discovers that science and technology are the major drivers of some of the most important events in international affairs and sometimes are the sources of solutions. With this critical understanding of the importance of science and technology, Secretary Carter spearheaded revolutionary improvements to the de Defense Department. At DOD, he launched six transformative Forces of Future initiatives to change the way the department recruits, trains, and retains quality people. And he also directed the opening of all military positions to women without exception. Secretary Carter has traded roles in academia for high-level positions at the Defense Department, serving President Clinton from 1993 to 1996, and then returning during the Obama administration from 2009 to 2017. For his government service, Secretary Carter has been awarded the Department of Defense Distinguished Service Medal, the department's highest civilian honor, on five separate occasions. And he twice received the Joint Distinguished Service Medal from the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff. Secretary Carter is currently the director of the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. Before I turn the session over to today's interviewer, Rich Serino, the former Deputy Director of FEMA and now a Distinguished Visiting Fellow for the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative at Harvard. Please join me as we welcome Secretary Ash Carter to the Voices in Leadership Series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us here at the Harvard T.H. Chan thanks, School of Public Health. Thanks for doing this yourself and thanks for what you have done for our country oh. also, Rich. Appreciate thank, thank, it. Thank you. Um, as we just heard in the opening a little bit about your bio, um, specifically what factors led to you, your decision about opening all military ranks and positions uh, with no exceptions to women? It was, well, uh, if you're the Secretary of Defense, you're the Secretary of Defense of today, so you, which means just beating our enemies, deterring potential enemies, so uh, whether it's ISIS, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, but you're also the Secretary of Defense of tomorrow, which means I need to be thinking ahead to what's going to make us good so that we can protect our people tomorrow. There are two big ingredients to that. One is technology, which is not the subject of really particular of this, this, this uh, audience and discussion, but the other is people, which very much is. Their health is part of it, but if you think of health in the large, uh, it is how do we manage the talent pool and what is after all an all-volunteer force, Rich, as you well know. We don't have a draft. I don't want a draft. We can talk about that later. Um, I want to pick. I don't want people picked for me is the essence of it. And But I have to pick from the population. Uh, and we're in the labor markets and we have to compete for young uh, people and try to attract the best. Now, in that connection comes the decision about women in service. And my view was, it wasn't hard to make the decision. I, I, I probably want to focus, Rich, a little bit on, on doing it. 
because it's one thing in public life to know what you want to do. It's another to get away with it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it wasn't a hard decision for the following reason. Um, it, it, this is half of our population. For me, in a competitive talent situation, to take half the population off the table when it comes to filling positions where merit is what matters uh, doesn't make any sense. And um, so in, uh, there were some uh, uh, particular areas, like being an artilleryman, that were restricted to males only. Um, and I wanted us to look at those areas and, and, and ask, and I asked the uh, uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the Chief of Staff of the Army, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the Chief of Naval Operations, the Head of Special Operations Command, the Secretary of the Air Force, Secretary of the Navy, and um, the Secretary of the Army, and I said, I want each of you to provide to me your uh, recommendation, but importantly, I want the basis for it. And I want you to have, to, to show me if you are going to recommend any exceptions, which almost none of them did in the end, I, I, I want to see the basis for it. And that's important because if you're going to make an important decision, you have to make sure that you've buttoned it down. You've really walked around it yourself and there are no, no nothing that, that can cause someone reasonably say, but, Mr. Secretary, what about, and you need to have thought all that all through and decided it's okay, and if it's okay, be able to explain why. And so I had each of them independently go through all of that, and with only one exception, I got back answers that said, I think we can work through these things, but they identified lots of issues. And I studied very hard on this, and I worked very hard on it personally. Um, because I wanted to make sure that I had mastered it, because I was going to be the one who had to defend it. And to, to bungle this would have been a historic mistake. Um, it would have set us back a day. We wouldn't have gotten around to it again for a decade or two. And it's a lot of my predecessors did not want to take this step. Uh, I, I think in part for their concern that they weren't going to be able to pull it off. So it was important to me that we, we do it right and that it be bulletproof when it went out there because if you think about the alternative, to, to botch this would dishearten all of those females, qualified females, who aspired to occupy those positions and we would lose the opportunity of having them. It would also dispirit all the other females in service who have chosen a different branch, maybe not artillery but intelligence or something else who would be confirmed in a second-class citizenship in the profession to which they'd given their lives. And that also is not good for recruiting females into those specialties where I need them too. I don't only need artillerymen, I need intelligence, logistics, communications, uh, and other medical and other, th other things. So to make a hash of this was a bad, bad outcome. And I wanted to make sure that that was not the case. So I studied these things, and there are issues. For example, um, if you're sending a elite team from which females have been traditionally excluded into a society that doesn't look upon gender the way we do, that is a fact of life, and I, we need to be effective. We need to be effective for our security there. And so there, there are going to be things that need to be worked around in particular circumstances. And anybody, any of you who knows, and maybe some of you have been part of the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so forth, and we have worked through those things. And we know that there, there are places where male military should not go, and there are places where female military should not go. Now, that's not our choice, and that's not our preference for how we conduct our own society, but if you're going to do a raid, for example, and you're going to go into a home and there are females in a home, you know that in that culture, it is, and you want to do that in a way that is not gratuitously offensive, uh, you need to have a female as part of that assault team who can deal with the women uh, in that house. So there are practical things that go, that, and, you, and, and, and I, I thought it was important that I had thought all those through. 
we looked at SWAT teams, we looked at astronauts, mixed gender teams of astronauts, any uh, other militaries that had successfully integrated in gender, and uh, tried to work through all these issues. I thought they were all very manageable, and most of my leadership uh, that worked for me uh, thought the, the, the same. Uh, and so I came to the decision that, that I was I was going to uh, uh, do that, uh, notwithstanding that there was one exception to that uh, advice. I thought it was important that I have a departmental or a joint solution. I wasn't going to let anybody have an exception. If every if there weren't going to be more than one exception, so I thought everybody's going to go. We're all going to head the same direction. And I did say that. Um, you know, look, it's not enough just to say we're going to do this. We need to do it right. We need to implement it. We need to, now that we've identified issues, we need to work through issues. You also have to recognize as it, that, that there will be those service members, male service members, who don't know how to conduct themselves with respect to females that are suddenly introduced to the kind of profession, the kind of specialty they're in. And they, we need to give them guidance and training so that we don't, there, there are not uh, incidents. So there, there, it, it requires some work. I kept it secret that I was doing it until I did it entirely by surprise. Nobody knew. Uh, the, uh, because, and so I walked out one Thursday and made a statement which I had written by myself on cardboard, <laughs> my favorite writing uh, surface, which said very calmly, specifically, and at great length, exactly why this was the right thing to do and how we had thought through it, looked at it from every angle, thought through everything, anticipated every possible objection, and gave the answer to that. And I wanted that all out there first, and then I said, okay, anybody want to criticize that? I think this is bulletproof. Otherwise, you're on the back foot, and they, they know you're going to make an announcement on Thursday, and every noisemaker in Washington, the press, gets to take a shot at it with uh, probably based on some caricature of what you're going to do rather than what you're actually going to do. And then you're, then you're clawing your way out of a hole, and that's no place to be. So I didn't want to do that. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say, Rich, is I didn't tell the president either. <laughs> and I and the reason for that is not that it, I, I called up at an hour before I made the announcement. I called his chief of staff, Dennis McDonough. I said, Dennis, you can put me through the president if you feel you need to, but in one hour I'm going to go out and open up all military positions to uh, women. And I uh, don't imagine the president will object uh, to that, but I would ask you to please shut up about it. I don't need the help. Because I, it, I, this can't. This has to be a professional uh, 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 defense judgment. I don't want it to be in the political sphere. Uh, so I didn't want. And to his great credit, the president, whom I'm sure would have, in some political sense, liked to take credit for this, would have been popular for his, did not. And and that was that was very good. And so, so it went extremely smoothly, and the, I, there was nothing in the press, and I didn't get one letter from the Congress. Not one. And you know, you can't close the most miserable little base somewhere and not get 20 <laughs> letters from the, from, the, from, the, from the Congress. So, so it's a, just a lesson that it's not enough to do it, you gotta, you gotta do it right. And it's gone real smoothly, and I don't think anybody, you know, it's all in the rearview mirror uh, now, as it should be. And we're at a, uh, this, this is called the Voices in Leadership. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the things, a few things that you mentioned showed some of the leadership and uh, specifically you started very first off talking about people mm -hmm. and how important the people were, but then bringing all the different groups that could shoot this down, if you will, within the organization and got all their buy-in and, and took care of just about how long did that process take from when you knew you wanted to do this until you called Dennis McDonough? Uh, well, I gave them lots of time. One of my predecessors had kicked this can down the road. He didn't think it, he could pull it off, and that's not because he was bad Secretary of Defense. I don't think he thought the time was ripe or something, and he wanted to prepare the way. Um, 
And so um, I began laying down tracks for this by asking the principal leaders, think this through for me and give me your responses. And I really got very thoughtful responses. Um, I remember particularly the Special Operations Command, which in a sense has the most difficulty with doing this because they do really funky things, um, uh, were, were, ex were extremely uh, thoughtful. It was, uh, it, we had to have a conversation about qualifications because the key here is that what matters for military service is your qualifications to do the job. That comes, that's the point here. As a male, female, I don't, uh, gay, straight, I don't care, qualifications are what matter. Uh, I needed to make it clear that we were not changing what was a qualification. Uh, we were just allowing women to compete for those positions based upon those qualifications. That was important. Therefore, it was important to say, and, and this is part of the input I got, you know, don't, don't everybody think that every artillery unit is going to be 50-50, male, female. So there aren't that many females actually who want to go into artillery, for starters. Just happens, and maybe that'll change, but that's just a fact. And second, on the physical aspects of the qualifications, which are only part of the qualifications, the women on average score lower in shoulders, you know, loading artillery shells. But that doesn't mean that there aren't women who have stronger shoulders than, <laughs> than men. And I want, the, I want them. Uh, I want them to have other attributes too, like the ability to make decisions and respond to things and be disciplined and all the other things that are qualifications. Uh, but I, I, I said, let's everybody, there are no quotas here, let's everybody be realistic about this. This is opening up a competition. And uh, I, I think all, all of it, it's qualifications, 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 that's what, and that, by the way, was true in women in service, don't ask, don't tell, transgender, um, uh, geography, um, you may not know this, but almost half of our recruits come from just six states, mm. um, which is another, so if I say we're not in the other 50% of the population, which is female, we're not adequately in the other 44 states that are not fully represented. So there are lots of forms of diversity, but the bottom line is, is getting the best people in the most qualified people. And I'll take them from any state, I'll take them in any gender, I'll take them in any sexual orientation, as long as they're the best people to do the job. And just change the topics for a little bit. A uh, number of us who think that there's a mega disaster scenario that, you know, whether it's an IND, a regional earthquake, uh, and DOD will be playing a major role, perhaps far-reaching than a lot of people have thought in the past. And we've seen how DOD has operated just in the past few months, mm -hmm, both mm -hmm. in Texas, Florida, and a lot in Puerto Rico. Um, what are your thoughts on DOD's role in these mega disasters? Well, it, it, it's important. Look, you bought and paid for this big machine. You pay $600 billion a year for it. it you, you don't, we don't buy it to deal with hurricanes. We buy it to fight wars and protect our, ourselves. But when it's there and there's a hurricane that affects our people, it is unreasonable for me not to want to apply that. Uh, now I can't pull people out of North, out of South, South Korea at the moment. I need my 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 deterrent force there, and I can't be putting them. But I have a, I have enough stuff uh, that I can uh, uh, deploy it. Now you know a, a lot of our people would have been working for you, because the way we do this is in the federal government we're not the the people who call the shots in disasters. FEMA calls the shots in disasters. We are a tool of them, and we subordinate ourselves, essentially, to FEMA for this, program, which is fine with me. Um, when it comes to things that the governors do with the National Guard, our people are subordinated to the command of the governor, not to mine, which is really the president's. When we federalize the Guard, then the chain of command is the president to me, to them. But uh, uh, that's only if they're operating in federal states. So, so this is all makes your eyes glaze over. This is just sort of the bureaucratics of getting it done. But for the citizen, citizens, as I pay my taxes, 
one of my fellow citizens is stricken with a disaster and you've got helicopters and hospitals and people and so forth sitting around, I don't want it just sitting around. I want to use it. That's a perfectly reasonable expectation. It's up to people like us to work out the details and make sure it's legal and constitutional and all that. But we can do that, and we have. With North Korea on the minds of many people and the possibility of a nuclear incident, what, do you, what would you see DOD's role in preparing for such attack? And also, from the public health part, I, I don't think a lot of people are uh, familiar mm -hmm. a lot with the public mm -hmm. health aspects that DOD has and their, what their response would be afterwards and the infrastructure throughout public health. These are about to be designed on a good oh, day, I tell you. but in the rest of the country, if something were to happen. Um, well, I mean, the f in the first case, there's much that we are doing, must do, can do to make sure we never get to the second part of your question. I don't want to be there. Uh, and with respect to North Korea, uh, uh, I've been working with North Korea. Uh, I've been working on, I, I did the strike plan in 1994 to take out their very first reactor, which we were prepared to do. Uh, we didn't do it because we reached an agreement with them that temporarily f forestalled the, the need to do that. But So I've been to this movie now for, for a couple of decades. Um, it's gotten worse because that was the grandfather, then there was the father, and now the son. Uh, and there are two aspects to it, Rich, I think. One, it, one is deterrence and defense because I'd like to, the second part is diplomacy, I'd like to turn them around but I'm not sure what we can do that. I'll tell you how I'd try, but I'm not sure. And therefore, we need to make sure that we are protected. And that's why we built and deployed years ago. And I was much criticized at the time. I was the weapons czar at that time uh, and for the Pentagon, as they called it. And they said, why are you building missile defenses? You're wasting money, blah, blah, blah. You're going to upset the Chinese, et cetera. And, uh, but I said, uh, because I don't know that someday the North Koreans won't be, get to the point where they could put a nuclear weapon on top of a missile and I can't not have my country protected. That's my job. So we did that. And so today there is, we're ready now. I'm not sure they're, they can do it, but if they did, we would shoot it down. And, um, and I think uh, our commander there Incidentally, is, is uh, General Lori Robinson is our NORTHCOM commander, and she's the one who I don't think is more than five paces away from a, a phone uh, at any time. She has the authority. She doesn't need to come to me, now Jim Mattis, or the president uh, for that. We delegated that authority because there isn't really time to think it through, and if you, if you were to make a mistake, it's not cosmic to have launched an interceptor. Um, and deterrence is about the strength of the, with those 28,500 troops we have and the huge machine that would come in according to our war plan behind them to defend South Korea, destroy the North Korean military, destroy the North Korean regime. We practice that, we're prepared to do that, and, and they, need, they know that. And we constantly try to emphasize to them that will be the outcome. And I'm confident that will be the outcome. We will win. It is a nasty war, uh, even putting aside nuclear weapons. This is a, a densely populated, uh, basically, the exurbs of a major city, Seoul, that this takes place in. So it is not a pretty sight and not something we should welcome. But we have to do defense and deterrence. Now, I'd like not to get there. And so what's the chances of turning them around? I know what I would do. I would, I called and I don't know whether we're doing this or you can't really tell from, 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 from the tweets and everything like this. I hope that um, uh, the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State are do doing this. I think they're equipped to, to do it. It's certainly the right idea. It's, it's essentially mixes uh, military and diplomatic, and uh, just the short form of it, Rich, just to stop, is, is to say to them, look, uh, uh, no more missile tests. If you do, here's what will happen to you. And if you don't, here's what can be done for you. No more underground nuclear tests. If you do, if you don't. And then you, and you step by step try to get them back to uh, halt 
and then reverse with a mixture of inducements, some of which come from us, some of which come from the Chinese, the Japanese, the South Koreans in an orchestrated way. Which, what doesn't work, in which we've had mostly for the last few years, uh, not just the last one year, but a few years, is they do something and then we throw sanctions at them, which is satisfying and certainly justified and, you know, is good old vengeance, but it doesn't help because they've already done the thing. You need to get out in front of their decisions. That may work, in it, but you have to take it bite by bite and try to get them back. And if they make the right decision enough times sequentially, we can get to a very good place with them. If they make the wrong decision enough times sequentially, why, why then that's, that's, that's the, that will be the road to their destruction. Um, but that's not the path we want them to go down. But it's their choice, not ours. And with the Obama's administration's commitment to the global health security agenda and the new administration's recently commitment to uh, support the global health security agenda until 2024, what's your perspective and role and importance of DOD in the global health security in respect to responding to disasters globally and emerging infectious Roughly diseases? Roughly analogous to um, uh, the, the situation at home, although uh, uh, we, 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 it's in the nature of things that we have a greater obligation to our own population, obviously, than we do to anybody else, but everybody else is human beings. And um, uh, so if we are able to help, we try to help. And if we're asked to, we do. Uh, and I can give you a couple examples, Fukushima, um, it, nothing did more to boost the perception of the United States military and the security alliance with Japan than our response to Fukushima. It made a huge, an ordinary Japanese citizen look at it, well, that's a friend. A friend showed up. We showed up with ships and helicopters and troops, and a friend in need. And that, that wasn't a war, but we showed that we were friends, and that, that made an enormous difference. And um, likewise, Ebola, I don't think the Ebola response could have been, you, 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 you know this very well yourself, and there may be others who worked on that. There are certainly people who are in Boston at Harvard and MIT who were central to the response, the Ebola response, and the, the, the suffocation of that epidemic, which is what you have to do, or you try to do with epidemics. Uh, before they can get out of hand. Um, and we contributed, you know, airplanes with, you know, the right kind of equipment installed in them and so forth. And I, I was perfectly happy to have us uh, do that wh where, where we could. And, you know, you work out the money within the government and so forth, but that's a detail. Uh, it's the citizens government, and, uh, and I think most Americans support the idea that if they're human beings in need, particularly if it's a disease situation where if it's not taken care of, it'll come here, um, we have a, an obligation and we certainly have a capability to help out. You know, you raised the idea of a nuclear detonation on the United States, and I, I get back to that in the case of, of North Korea. That's not going to happen because we're not going to allow that. But I, it, it, it's been so long since we've conducted any uh, uh, nuclear tests and so forth. I think people have forgotten what, uh, 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 even a single nuclear weapon is a nasty, nasty business. Uh, it poisons a whole area for a generation. Now you hit a city, you not only destroy that city, but in the plume downwind of that for miles, it becomes uninhabitable. Anybody who doesn't exit that area gets a lethal dose or a, a dose that is, is harmful to them. And uh, I, I don't, I, I don't I, people talk casually about this. It's been a long time since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's been a long time since the tests in the islands and in Kazakhstan by the United States and Soviet Union, tests by other countries. Uh, around the world, and you go out there, if you know about radiological poisoning and so forth, and you go out and, you know, in your, in your mind you can, you can get data that shows you how many rads and 
so forth of exposure there will be. And man, I'll just tell you, it, just one of those would shock the conscience of humankind for a very, very long time. And we don't, twice was enough, we don't need a reminder. Uh, but it's our job to make sure it doesn't happen. Great. And just one last question, last minute. Um, what would you recommend is one or two leadership tips for uh, folks here in the room and folks listening as well? Um, uh, uh, the two, two, two things are as important to me, which are clarity and example. Uh, clarity means that you convey your judgments and your instructions in as intelligible a manner. I worked very hard on explaining what I was doing. Um, and that helped people to do what I wanted them to do, either to agree with it if I didn't actually need their help or if they worked for me to do what I wanted to do. Clarity is, and that takes hard work. And it takes looking at people and saying, I wonder what they're wondering about this. And let me take seriously what they're wondering. And if I can accommodate it, do. And if I can't, I need to explain to them why they're not going to get accommodated uh, on that issue. That takes a lot of hard work. The other is uh, uh, example and conduct. And I can't emphasize this enough. I, 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 and it needs to be said today, the, uh, I always insisted, I always tried to conduct myself appropriately in a public setting because it wasn't just about me. Uh, and uh, I think everybody in public life has an extra obligation to behave appropriately. And that's especially true in the profession of arms, which is about honor and about trust. And you have to uh, reflect that in how you, how you behave towards service members, towards their families. You make decisions. I wrote, you know, I, I signed deployment orders. And, uh, you, you know, that's no greater responsibility uh, than that. And you need to care for them and their families. And you need to show that. I'll just give you, a, Rich, a sort of a little example of it. I used to be, you look at pictures of me out when I, I, I obviously spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, all the war zones. And you see me when I'm Secretary of Defense and I'm out there in the desert and it's 100 degrees and I'm talking to troops, U.S. or or Iraqi or allied or something, big bunch of troops out there, and telling them what I want them to do and what we need them to do and what our war plan is for them, what their operations plan uh, is. And uh, there I am in a suit just like this and, you know, sweating like a wheel of cheese. <laughs> and, and, and people ca would come up to me and say, hey, you know, I want to take your suit off or take your jacket off or something. I said, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that for the very simple reason. I, I'm here, I'm going to shake some kid's hand you know, who's 18 years old. Uh, and they're going to get a picture of that, and they're going to send it to his mother, and his mother's going to frame it, and she's going to put it on the mantle or on the side of the bed. And I need to look the part. And I can't look like I'm on safari. <laughs> I need to look like the Secretary of Defense. So I just suck it up. An hour after hour, you shake and sweat, sport it down, you, you shake hands. Because you, 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 it, that's the right and appropriate uh, thing to do. And I, I, just, I just can't emphasize it. We, we live in a society that is lost uh, in, 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 in many places regard for proper comportment. And uh, don't lose that. Don't, don't, don't lose that. Well, thank you very much. I think thank we're you. out of time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all for being here. Appreciate it.